Good morning. Happy. Hallelujah. Happy Easter. Yes. The cross is empty, amen? Amen. The tomb is empty, amen? Amen. The angel said, why are you looking for the dead among the living among the dead? Well, let's say that again. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Amen? Amen.
welcome to worship this morning, whether you are here in person or watching online, whether you're a first-time visitor or been here all your life. It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord together again. Amen? Amen. Let's have the kids come up. Kids, and if your parents want you to wear a mask, we have some masks over here. Y'all can just come right down front. Good morning. Perfect timing.
Changes his mind? Yeah, yeah, he's he's had had that
us. He loves all of us because of that right there. He's not there because he's not there. We live. Amen.
The first one is that nobody, nobody expected a resurrection. The second point they all have in common is that there was nobody in the tomb. They all agreed there was no body in the tomb. So they had no idea where Jesus had gone. He was supposed to be in the tomb. So many of them were there when they rolled this huge stone away across it, creating this entombment. And so the one thing they all wanted to know is, where is Jesus? And so as our passage begins this morning, Mary arrives not for a resurrection, but for a burial. Mary goes not to, not to celebrate this new creation. She wanted to go check on her Lord to make sure all was secure, prepare his body for the burial rite. So that is her main purpose in going. And when we read the scripture, you're going to see proof of that because just think about her hands. She doesn't go carrying this array of Easter flowers. She goes carrying spices for burial. And as she carries those, it is the weight of her grief that weighs her down. And so I want you to hear from our scripture today. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started out of the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave him his message. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks. Before we pray, I want to let you know, and those that are watching online, at the end of sermon, we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion. So if you have not received your elements, would you please raise your hand so we can make certain that we have enough to go around when it's time to do communion. If you are watching from home, um, online, gather whatever you're going to use, whether it be a cracker and juice or a chip and coffee or Pop-Tart and milk, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit will take care of that. So you just get your elements and have them ready at the end of service. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you so much for this day to come together as we have lifted praise and as we have heard your word proclaimed. Now, gracious God, we ask you to pour yourself into this message that the meditations of all of our hearts and the words that cross my lips be pleasing to you and directly from your mouth. We ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So Mary Magdalene was the first to go and discover the empty tomb. Uh, the death of Jesus had meant something to everyone. It had, been, it had been stressful for everyone, but especially troubling to her. This was a woman that Jesus had delivered from seven different demons. Seven different demons. I'm telling you, she went from demonic to disciple in one single miracle. Then at one point, it was said that she was not thinking clearly, that she might have been a little bit insane. 
that was, that was tagged on her as well. There was also a saying that she was a prostitute at one time. And so for him to come to her first was so powerful. But she knew that Jesus had been placed in this tomb, laid in their bed. She didn't know what was going to happen next. Would these demons come back to her? Would all of this power that he had laid on her life suddenly go away? Would all of these, these demons begin chasing her? Would she become a slave to the devil? All of this had to be going through her mind because he had rescued her. She had been free to love and serve the Lord, and she had been as faithful as any of those 12 men had been. So she had to be worrying because she knew what he had done for her. She had witnessed it personally, but then she watched him die. She was there at the cross when he died. She was there when they took him down. She was there when, when they took him, Nicodemus and Joseph took him and laid him in the tomb. She was there. So she had to be worried. So she sees this at the tomb and she goes and finds that the stone has been rolled away. Now John tells the story a little bit different than all of the other writers. John actually lets you see her wrestle and kind of process this whole thing. He kind of lets you walk through it with her. And I want you to listen back to verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple. They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. Now, first thing is, she sees the stone rolled away. It doesn't say she went inside. She didn't go inside and look. In fact, it lets us know in another version she did not go inside. So she sees the tomb roll away, and she immediately believes his body has been stolen. Nobody says that. She doesn't see it for herself, but she immediately thinks the grave has been robbed rather than Jesus robbed the grave. You see that? She doesn't see that that's what happened. She didn't see that the grave has been conquered. She just believes that someone has stolen his body. So John lets us know, when, as he tells the story, that she goes to get Peter. And as she comes back with Peter and the disciple that Jesus loves, they go in. She still doesn't go in. She still stays back. But they go in. They see that the tomb is empty. And it says, John believed. John saw and believed is what it says. She still didn't even draw a conclusion from John that Jesus had been risen from the dead. She still believes that he had been stolen. And so it says that Peter, Simon Peter, and, and the disciple Jesus loved left. And it says she stands outside crying. After a little bit, it says she goes in. She goes in and she sees these two angels. And she just starts conversing with them like they're people. No, no bother about it. They ask her why she's crying. And she says they've stolen my Lord's body. She's talking to them just like they're people. Then, as they tell her not to worry, and she turns around to go, she sees this man standing there. She believes is the gardener. It's Jesus, and she fails to recognize him standing right in front of her. He asks her the same question. Why are you crying? And then he says to her, don't miss this, because he says to her, and who are you looking for? She came and she was looking for a dead Jesus. She was looking for a dead body to prepare for burial. She didn't recognize the resurrection was standing right in front of her. She was so deep in her grief, so deep in what she perceived to have happened, she couldn't even see it standing in front of her. And so when she says they've stolen his body, y'all, how do you think Jesus kept a straight face? I mean, really. Y'all, if he was from Texas, he would have said, bless your heart. <laughs> I don't even know how he kept a straight face. Because while she's in there looking to memorialize something, the resurrection and life is standing in front of her. The peace, everything, the living Lord, everything is standing right in front of her. And she doesn't even recognize it. My question to you this morning is, who are you here looking for? Who are you here looking for in this place? Who are you looking for in your life? Who are you seeking? Because Jesus isn't just merely a historical figure. He's not just a great teacher. He is the peace that passes understanding. He is the bright hope for tomorrow. He is the resurrection and the life, the alpha and the, the omega, the resurrected one that laid down his life and picked it back up for you. Amen. That's who he is. If somebody said, hey, I'm going to kill you, Jesus, he'd go, I've been there, done that. Right? He's already defeated it, and he defeated it for you. 
for each and every one of you. So Mary is so deep in her realm of death that she cannot even get past it. But I want, I want you to realize what he says in what John says between the two questions. The first question he, that Jesus says to her is, who are you looking for? When it says that he asked her a second question, it says in verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. He calls her by name. And it says she turned toward him and called him rabbi. Now that lets me know if you turn toward somebody, that means you had your back to them, right? She turned her back on Jesus, y'all. She was so deep in her grief, she didn't even recognize him. She didn't even recognize the Lord standing. She almost missed the resurrection power. Don't be here this morning and miss the resurrection power. Amen. Do not miss the resurrection power. Because how often are we like Mary that we let our grief or we let our struggles or we let our trials so completely block our vision, we miss the resurrection standing right in front of us. It happens. We're all guilty, right? Every single one of us are guilty. We have to put our trust in God because so often people tend to live in this doom and gloom and tomb lifestyle that they miss that resurrection in life part of the story. They miss that part of it. They fail to grab hold of that. Now, I want to tell you all that when he called Mary by name, he gave her a new lease on life. He calls her Mary. She realizes it's him. She grabs hold of him, and y'all, he gives her a job. He says, go out and preach the gospel. A female preacher. Right, <laughs> right there. Right there it is, y'all. Sorry, guys. Female preacher. Jesus needed Mary to go and witness and tell the good news. That's what he was using her for. Y'all, what's Jesus trying to use you for that you're not listening? Because there's something. All of us have a job. All of us have a calling. All of us have something that God is calling us to. And sometimes this is what we do. Right? We turn our back and we leave God standing there. He'll call somebody else, y'all. He'll call somebody else to do that job. But here's the thing. The resurrection teaches us to live as conquerors. Yes. And so whatever fear we have of doing whatever we're called to do was completely covered by that sacrifice. Right? That's our job is to go out and tell people, Jesus lives. Jesus lives. He's alive, y'all. He's alive. That's our job. Go and tell people that, right? Maybe grief has gripped your life at some point. Maybe there is something that you cannot live with joy because of some trial or, or some addiction or some hardship in your life. Maybe that's what keeps your soul just weeping. But if you just listen, you'll hear Jesus call your name. You'll hear Jesus call you, wanting to pull you out of that grave and resurrect you from something today. Something that Jesus is calling you to do. A dream or a purpose or something Mary knew in the end, once she realized who that was, she had no demon to fear. There was nothing she could fear anymore because Jesus had conquered the grave. No power could come against that. Her power, his power could never be overtaken. He proved that over and over and over. Had she missed it, had she missed the resurrection, she would still be letting death have a final word. And that is no way to live. Don't stand on the outside looking in. Don't stand there weeping when you can be rejoicing. Don't miss the resurrection. Don't turn around and miss it. And don't live in the realm of death and be defeated. Because here's the thing. If we follow the resurrected king, we are conquerors. We are. We have spent the entire Lent giving things up like control and our enemies and superiority and our, our perspectives that are wrong and um, giving up our own life and giving up what we choose instead of what God would have us choose. And here's the thing. This is not just some feel-good story. This is not something we just come celebrate once a year. We're Easter people, and that means the cross is still overcome, the tomb is still empty, and death has still been defeated. That's the, that's the Easter story, y'all. That's what we celebrate. Guys, rise up and take your death clothes off and have that resurrection power. Because yes. that is what we have through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this day to come together to celebrate your victory over death. To celebrate your victory over, over all of the powers of sin and death and hell. And we thank you, God, that you have offered us eternal life the moment you busted out of that tomb. And so we thank you, Holy God, for that gift that you give us. 
as we step closer to you day in and day out. Make us courageous, make us bold, give us words to say as we proclaim your victory, gracious God. It is nothing by our power, but all by your resurrection power. And so we thank you for that. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you will take your communion elements, I want you to remember that if, if you were here Monday, Thursday, we celebrated Holy Communion. And this, the Sunday of Easter always makes communion so much more powerful. It brings it to life. Um, it reminds us of the sacrifice that was made. And as Jesus hung on that, on that cross and his body broken for us, he said in that upper room, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he lifted it up and he gave thanks to God. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. That meant that whenever that veil was torn from top to bottom, and for once in all of history, everyone in the world could look in there and see the Holy of Holies, and they could look in there and see the Ark of the Covenant, and no one had to go to a priest on your behalf. You now had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this bread and cup. We pray that you pour your Holy Spirit over it and make each person that partake of it. Let it be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, broken and shed for us, for the redemption of our sins, and for all of the world. We ask you to strengthen us, to encourage us, and to redeem us to go out into the world and preach and proclaim the gospel. We ask all this in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen.